Studies Panel and Recognition Ceremony. I am Andy Dye, Director of INT 101. We are so pleased to have a showcase panel who's going to be coming up in just a little bit. Um, they are Mercer alumni, all from the last two years, who are really using their Mercer education to change the world now. And they're going to have a chance to share with you what they love about Mercer and how the liberal arts education really made them a better person and a better human being. Well, next month, walking across that graduation stage will be our very first group of students who arrived here in the fall of 2012 under our new Gen Ed curriculum. And it has been a true blessing to be a part of their educational journeys over the last four years. I like to say we've had a front row seat for their transformation into the person that they are now. In their INT classes, the three core sequence, they pondered what it means to be human. They saw them change as both good and bad in both the community and the world. They were enriched and challenged by both beauty and truth through the engagement in arts. And tonight we have nine students who model what we hope is Mercer's transformative education. Austin Harrison is going to be a part of our panel. He's here, along with Ada Andrews, Alex Morrison, and Laurel McCormick. We'll have formal introductions of our four alumni panelists in just a moment. We're so glad that y'all are here. Last week, I got to present Austin Harrison with our very first Integrative Inquiry Award. Austin is a graduating senior from Winder, Georgia. He is our current student government association president. Last week when I called him up to hand him that award, I asked him if he remembered that day in August 2012 as a brand new freshman. It's the second day of Drop Ad. He came by my office and he wanted to change from great books to INT. And I helped change it into Dr. Trogdon's very first INT 101 class. She wrote me that early on in that semester, after Austin saw the powerful documentary Waiting for Superman, that he looked at his own strengths and his talents. And instead of just talking about what could be done, he wanted to use his own strengths to reform schools and the community. And he's always articulated how INT can shape his worldview. Austin, we're so glad you made that switch that day and uh, you embody what liberal arts are all about. Uh, you've cultivated the whole student, not just intellectually, but emotionally, spiritually, and morally. Austin had a chance to pick out a special gift for his award, and he's going to be uh, starting in law school this fall, and uh, the book he picked out is The Death and Life of the Great American Cities. Um, he's graduating cum laude with a major in history, minor in teacher education, and African studies. Um, Austin, come on up. We'll present you your book and uh, congratulate you formally again on your award. Generous with her peers, 
and insightful in how she had used her readings and assignments. She made her writing meaningful, scholarly, and personal. She is from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and she's interested in majoring in media studies. Come on up, Tiffany. shyness 
and dove with tremendous energy into their roles in a reacting to the past game. This is a game in which students, it's a multi-week thing, it can take about three weeks to uh, play one of these games. And students must adhere to the philosophical and intellectual beliefs of historical figures while devising their own means of expressing those ideas persuasively in papers, speeches, or other public presentations, and pursuing a course of action they think will help them win the game. I wish I could have taken a reacting to past class. I don't know about you, but it sounds, they're, they're, they're pretty impressive. So you have to have a little bit of setting. It's 1913, suffragists, members of the labor movement, and African-American activists have converged on Greenwich Village in New York City to debate their views with artists and bohemians who are remaking themselves into the new men and new women of the 20th century. What social changes are most important? How can one, or how should one, realize those changes? <coughs> Shannon and Anne are leading the lab labor faction. They articulate the demands of the working class in moving in historically accurate ways. One day, they hold a picnic to commemorate a strike in New Jersey. They actually hold a picnic. Another day, they lead people outside to picket. They make pro-labor buttons and posters. They give impromptu speeches. Shannon wrote and directed and acted in a play to dramatize the plight of immigrant women. This is all within the class. Anne spoke with passion and compassion on the question of how to motivate people beyond self-interest because she wanted to know for herself how she could live in a better, more just community. And when labor could have won the game by slightly compromising their political views, Anne stayed true to her character and walked out. So please uh, help me recognize uh, Shannon Alexander and Anne Schwann. passion prompted them to act within the context of this reacting to the past game, but our next two honorees, Jonathan Erickson and Chelsea Whittington, put their passion to work in the Mercer and Macon communities. Chelsea is majoring in, Chelsea is actually from Macon, Georgia, and she's majoring in early childhood education, holistic child. John is uh, from Dawsonville, Georgia, and majoring in psychology with a sociology minor, and he's planning to get a degree in physical therapy. As required in Stacy Harris's building community class, Chelsea and John tutored weekly in local high schools as part of the AVID program, teaching kids learning skills that could be applied in all of their classes. This program lets students experience firsthand some of the hardship that making kids, many of whom are significantly disadvantaged, face both inside and outside of school. Chelsea and John recognized that the need for tutoring is greater than Abbott can meet and knew that Mercer students could be counted on to help out. So they sprang into action. They set out to create the BEARS Initiative, Bettering Educational Access for, uh, for Remedial Students. This organization has yet to, get, uh, to become active and get recognized by Mercer because there were a number of things that they are, had to sort out. It was not sort of a simple thing to, to do. But they are making, uh, they're making very good progress on this. So they have um, found a community organization with which to partner. They have found sources of volunteers here on campus. They've figured out things, how to streamline the process of getting people the background checks that they need. Uh, so keep your eyes out for the BEARS initiative uh, starting next year. And please join me in recognizing 
Jonathan Erickson and Chelsea Whittington, please. Psychology, who is the director of INT 301, um, which she can tell you about. So, INT 301 is, not surprisingly, the third course in our general education sequence. Students are intended to take that as juniors or seniors, and I don't think it's just because I happen to direct 301, but I think it's particularly important. It's basically launching students out into the larger world. The title is Engaging the World, and the idea is we're hoping, we hope that we help students to take their Mercer education and figure out the next steps as they go into the world. How are they going to make a difference in the world? We have one nominee to recognize, Lauren Maxwell, and I don't believe she was going to be here tonight. Yes, she is here. All right, come on up. So Lauren got a glowing nomination from her INT 301 instructor, Gordon Johnston, who taught a, court on our, a course on art and colonialization um, for his INT 301 section. He said, um, Lauren, contributes, con her contributions move the class to respond and engage. She was a model of comportment, organization, and discernment. Her writing was clear, thoughtful, detailed, appropriately interpretive and critical, and entertaining. Her final project was an, a hand-stitched book that perfectly and poignantly captured the lessons of the class. In sum, she challenged her peers and her professor and brought us all to a more abiding and intelligent awareness of our citizenship in the world. Um, but a little bit about my path. Um, 
I came to Mercer in 2008, and uh, this is the first weekend um, on campus. These two girls I met at orientation, and they remain two of my very best friends today. Um, so I was here for four years, majored in international affairs and photography, um, did all sorts of uh, all sorts of things, and graduated in 2012. Um, had a vocational crisis, which I think is lasting to this day, so it's what a great, uh, great reason to come and talk about vocation. Um, so I headed up to Connecticut. That was kind of stupid, but... Um, <laughs> and this is in the great Nemo blizzard of 2013. Um, and I lived in an intentional Christian community with a group of people for two years. Um, and worked uh, as a full-time intern for those two years at a refugee resettlement nonprofit called IRIS in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, we work with people who have fled persecution based on their race, nationality, political opinion, um, membership in a certain social group, or nationality. And they've been vetted by the State Department and then they come to us uh, and we help welcome them and start new lives in New Haven. Um, they are from the Sudan, uh, from the Congo, from Iraq and Iran, Syria. Um, some of the things I do there, I'm in charge of kind of a grab bag of programs, but um, I figure out how volunteers and interns can get involved. I uh, started a program called Cultural Companions. This woman, Sylvia, is uh, paired with two Syrian families. This is our first home visit, and he's reading Turkish grinds, um, coffee grinds. That's her fortune. Um, and I help coordinate soccer programming uh, for men and boys, for women and girls. Um, I run cultural orientation classes for adults uh, that are about uh, rights and laws, healthcare system, all sorts of the nitty gritty of, of American life. Um, and sometimes we just have dance parties because you gotta dance and um, try to have some cultural celebrations. More dancing, I love to dance. Um, so I make everybody dance with me. And late, latest and newest project is trying to support a group of refugee leaders um, to become more civically involved and represent their communities um, at the table when important decisions are being made in our city. Um, so we went to a UN uh, listening session with the senior advisor on refugees um, recently in New York City. Um, yeah, and that's that. Good evening, uh, my name is Alex Morrison, uh, class of 2007, and journalism and philosophy. Um, so you, you'll quickly learn that of the panel, I'm the old guy. Um, it, it, it's a little bit strange to, to consider uh, how long uh, I've, I've been a bear at this point, that it, you know, coming to, to Mercer in 2003, and, and since uh, Dr. Dye asked me to be on the panel, how much I've had to think about my whole life and, and, and how it's been influenced by my education here and time and time again, it's, yeah, it's come out that almost everything that I do is influenced in some way by the education here. Uh, I grew up in Pike County, Georgia um, which would be shocking if anyone knew where that was, and it's okay uh, if you don't. And came to Mercer in 2003 and fell in love with Mercer and Macon uh, and, and the, the responsibility that it takes to be a, an alum of this, this university. And uh, during my time here, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I, I, I think when I came in, I figured I would be a lawyer. My brother was in law school. Uh, so I thought that would probably be the track I would take and decided, no, I don't want to do that. I probably want to be a journalist. 
uh, and so maybe that's not what I want to do. I really want to be a philosopher, and, and maybe that's a little too much in the clouds. And uh, through my educational journey, ended up deciding I really want to be in public administration. I want to work in the government. Uh, because guess what? That's where a lot of change happens. You might not believe that. Uh, but, but a lot of things that we do uh, influences a lot of different people. And it's where you can do a lot of good. It's where the rubber meets the road in our society is how our commonwealth is displayed is, is through that. And I'm uh, very much a, a excited to be a part of the Macon fabric here. Uh, my day job is as executive director of the Macon Bid County Urban Development Authority. We plan economic development in downtown Macon. Uh, how many of you go to downtown Macon on a regular basis? Good. <laughs> the answer would have been fewer in 2007. Um, so, and, and that's in a large part because of the work of the Urban Development Authority and several other partners, uh, several of whom are Mercer affiliated as well. And we're just very excited to be here, and a lot of the other things will be addressed in, in the other questions, but thank you very much for this opportunity to, to come share with you about our educational journey. same last name as that guy. Uh, we are married. Uh, but my professors uh, for Mercer name is Alita Andrews. So I'm Alita Andrews Morrison uh, in all three of my names. I have to brag on my husband a little bit. Something he um, maybe was maybe bashful and left out is that um, if you've ever heard of the College Hill Corridor, um, you can thank Alex and four other Mercer seniors who started that program along with Dr. Peter Brown that uh, is now Sunset, but that has had a huge impact on the community. So that was a Mercer creation. Um, that we're, I'm very proud of. So, <laughs> so I uh, came to Mercer in 2005 as a freshman. I graduated in 2009. I came from Thomaston, Georgia, which is actually near Pike County. You may have heard of Thomaston. It's about 30 miles south of Griffin. If you've heard of Griffin, that's good too. But it's a very small town. Um, and a uh, very small town girl coming to what I thought was a very large city. And if you're not from Macon, you probably think that's silly, but it was a big place for me. Um, Mercer was transformative for me in many ways. It gave me the opportunity to be a very well-rounded student, which is what Mercer does so well. Uh, it helped me to be social. I was in a sorority. Uh, it helped me to be a leader. I was in student government. It helped me to um, broaden my horizons. I got to study abroad at Oxford uh, in England, which was wonderful for a whole semester. And it also made me very confused about my vocation because I wanted to do lots of things. Um, I ended up, uh, I was also a great book student and uh, loved that, which would again help me come full circle when I tell you what I do for a living. Um, so uh, my senior year, I was in sort of a quarter life crisis and uh, decided I was going to go to law school, uh, which is sort of a theme. And I got into Mercer Law School, and uh, a lot of my professors, including um, Dr. Grant and uh, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Gardner and Dr. Johnson said, are you really sure that's what you want to do? And I said, yeah, I think people tell me I talk a lot, so I'd be good at that, right? And I'm stubborn. And they said, no, I think you need to be a teacher. And I said, a teacher? What? I, I mean, I went to Mercer, great books, like high school, are you serious? Which now I hate myself for saying. Um, and I said, no, I'm going to law school. And they said, OK, we'll write you recs, but we really think you need to be a teacher. And uh, Teach for America or something like that. And I was like, no. So I went to Mercer Law School for a year. And Mercer is a wonderful law school. I had nothing to do with school, but I hated it. I was miserable. That's not what I want to do for a living. So in February of that year, Alex and I had just begun dating, and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a teacher, and uh, I entered a Master of Arts in Teaching program. The next month, after my first year of law school that I didn't return to, uh, I got my master's and uh, started teaching, and I teach high school history. Um, and I uh, also teach at the Governor's Honors Program um, in Valdosta. I've taught it for five summers, and I'm going back for a sixth summer. And I incorporate a lot of what I learned from my Mercer professors seminar-based education, research-based education in my own classroom, and hope to maybe sort of model what they did, which was so great, because I'm a huge uh, fangirl of all the Mercer professors, so that's what I did. My name is Austin Harrison. My full-time 
career as student currently, <laughs> senior year at Mercer University. And uh, that was uh, to brag on Miss Andrews, as I always called her, at GHP. Uh, I actually had my first interaction with Mercer through her uh, in 2011. I was part of her first GHP class. And she played a large role of uh, why I came to Mercer. You see a lot of this, this event kind of brings a lot of things first, full circle for me. Um, and so originally from Winder, Georgia, a small town set of Athens. So at the time, um, when I went to GHP, that kind of played a large role in making me uh, want to go to Mercer instead of UGA, uh, despite my entire family and all friends going there. I decided to be adventurous and come to Macon, Georgia, and on, um, on a completely undecided path. Uh, I too chose law school for a while, but uh, to, to kind of give away the school at the ending, I'm actually not going to law school. Maybe I haven't communicated that well to my faculty, so I'm, I'm going to take the blame for, uh, for that miscommunication, but I'm actually headed uh, to grad school at UGA, going back to Athens. Uh, but, uh, but I came to the university not knowing what I was going to do, and uh, for the longest time, um, I had, uh, had my eyes on, I uh, came to business school knowing that wasn't the case, and enrolled in IIT after dropping out of great books, as Dr. Dad mentioned, and, um, and had probably the most transformative uh, class in, in my life, uh, Dr. Chagin's IIT 101 class, where uh, we really got the opportunity, as you often do at Mercer, to think critically um, about a lot of the world's problems, and I really saw, I kind of surprised myself with the sort of passion I had for the education system and for the injustice and poverty that has still like, exists in, in our, our community domestically and internationally. And uh, the, the passion surprised me so much that I kind of started thinking to myself, I should probably, should probably act on this. Probably shouldn't be an undecided business major anymore. And maybe I start making some decisions about my academic future, my professional future. And I originally landed in the education field uh, and then enrolled in secondary education um, and started taking a lot of those classes in sophomore year. And it started getting involved a lot in uh, the making community uh, through an organization called Communities and Schools. So I was uh, lucky enough to sit on the board of directors, and then I also later worked with them um, on the staff. And it was through this organization and other experiences that I learned that a lot of times um, uh, a, a, a chief problem that happens in our schools is it's not so much the education or the policy, but it's uh, kids coming into class more worried about where their next meal is coming from as opposed to their math test. And so I, I then really had an intense realization um, and went to Cape Town, South Africa, saw very similar problems a lot, and, and condensed a lot of the, the issues in, in America. And kind of woke up and realized that the, the, real, um, the, the real true problem was the communities that our kids were growing up in. And, and a lot of times the homes these children were coming from. And if I spent a lot of time working on community development, um, economic development, neighborhood development uh, at, at the public, local level, uh, then maybe potentially more than likely the education would would improve in those neighborhoods. So I decided to go that route, and I spent the last year working um, on a research project in Bloomfield with the help of Alex Morrison. I just actually presented to the county commissioners um, a couple of weeks ago, and we're getting a little support on that. Um, but, but that's sort of how my first education, if you can't tell, was uh, very, very integral and, and shaping that entire process. And I'm scared, and I often try not to think about where I'd be if it wasn't for Mercer University. And if I had actually gone to UGA, so go for it. So I think we've heard some amazing stories of personal transformation already. That's actually quite inspirational. Um, I'd like to fo shift our focus a little bit more now to our current students and ask you, and I don't need to come up here if we can just use the next set of the table, to think about what advice you would give current students to make the most of their Mercer education. So you're clearly all done to the max, that's a pretty inspiring, but uh, what would you re recommend the students here um, do to prepare themselves for a vocation, to find a vocation like you've been able to do? And whoever is inspired to move first can Okay. Yeah. Oh man. Um, okay. Great. So I want to. Um, I would like to share a little bit more about um, my time here, and I'll try to like tie it into what I think it means for students now. But. Um, I, I don't think that Mercer prepared me for a job. 
um, or a specific profession. I think Mercer prepared me for a vocation. Um, and vocation means to me that I am taking my values, um, that I am certain of where I came from uh, and who I am, and I stand on those strongly in order to um, interact with and, and try to walk alongside people who are not like me. Um, so I came to Mercer certain uh, that I wanted to serve, uh, I wanted to help people, I wanted to help international people. Um, I went back and like, read some of my great books, um, and we used to call it FYS instead of INT uh, papers, and from the very beginning, like in August 2008, I was already writing about Afghanistan and Iraq and women in these countries and how I was going to be an international photojournalist and, and change everything. I was going to, I was going to save people. Um, and what I felt like Mercer did over the course of four years was allow me to come with all of that enthusiasm uh, and passion for something um, and temper it and make me humble um, and realize that I really, uh, it's not my place to save anyone per se, uh, but that I need to always uh, be trying to open my eyes, trying to look out and see who is not here with us now, like what people groups are, are not here with us now. I always, um, I think even as a kid, before I came to Mercer, I, I struggled with why was I born in America? Why was I born white? Uh, what privileges did that, did that give me uh, automatically? And what does it mean now that I've got these educational opportunities? And um, so thinking sort of about some of the, some of the major ways that, um, that I was sort of transformed and, and what I think that means for students now. Um, one is, is that I remember really clearly um, taking part in like, Dr. Drake was one of my great books teachers and allowed us to put on a musical in place of an essay because I popped the question to her, I was like, I'm sick of writing essays where you let us do a musical. She was like, sure. It was so much more work than writing the essay, but I remember the Odyssey better than I remember any other work of literature. Um, and so that creativity um, and problem solving and working with a team, um, I feel like I use every day in program implementation and, and trying to figure out what's working, what's not working, what's sticking with people, what's what's slipping through their minds. Um, my, I had um, the chance to meet a group of people uh, called the Glad River Congregation uh, when I was a a sophomore. Um, so the group of people who are still affiliated with Mercer, uh, used to used to teach here, used to live on campus, um, created the first, the very first uh, version of FYS or INT, um, and they have a little church, still have a little church going, and I came in as the only current student in their midst, and um, you know, I, I came in a Christian, and I left Mercer a Christian, but a lot happened in between. And Mercer was a place where being historically Southern Baptist, but now wanting to be inclusive of LGBT people, of, of uh, champions of racial um, uh, equity, and trying to think of um, social justice in other countries. This, these were all things that um, this group, Bad River, um, would bring every Sunday to a kind of a Quaker-style congregational uh, discussion. There's like 12, 12 of us or so, or 12 of them. Um, and they let me come, and they let me sit around and, and listen to them. Um, and I feel like the same kinds of things happened in, in classes that I was so eager at first to, to solve problems and to, and to figure everything out and eventually realized um, I need to be listening really carefully for what other people are actually saying because um, there, are, there are so many people that um, don't get to be in classes like this with us um, who are in other countries, who are in um, 
you know, born into situations and won't ever have the same educational opportunity. So if I can't listen really carefully and hear the other people sitting at a so Socratic seminar table with me, um, and I'm always waiting to speak immediately after them, if I'm not listening deeply, how am I going to listen to those people who are really, really different from me? Um, and yeah, so <laughs> a couple things that I want I want you guys to, to stay the course with liberal arts because I feel like um, I'm sort of dismayed that so many people are choosing pre-professional tracks now um, and, and not taking that time to, to build relationships with their professors, to go abroad for extended periods of time, um, to, to be present, like just pick one or two extracurriculars and really stick with them. Show up and be committed uh, to your fellow students. Um, Rather than worrying, you know, I'm pre-med, am I going to make it? I'm, I'm pre-law, I'm great books so that I can be pre-law. Am I, am I going to make it? Because um, this is like the beautiful, beautiful time for you to explore these questions of who am I, who am I in relation to people who are really different from me, um, and kind of be filled up with all of this beauty and this exploring, and, and let the professors like pour into you. You have. I had no idea how lucky I was to like go to my professor's houses constantly and to and to have the after you know like coffee and tea hours with them uh, to go to church with them to to run into them all over the place um, and that I think as much as you bring to the table as a student your professors are going to match that they're going to want to pour into you as much as you're willing to pour into their classes um, and. I, I almost felt like that was an anointing, like that was my, my blessing. Um, go out now. We've humbled you, we've tempered and, and tamed your enthusiasm. You can't save the world, but you can, you can do your part. Um, now go out. We've poured all this into you. Um,
that that was one of the things that was really pressed upon me in my capstone class, um, which was the class that, that led to the corridor, is it was right there in front of you. You have to engage the city that you're in, the space that you are, and you have to leave it better. Um, the, the two pieces of advice here intersect because, yes, there is no better time to strike big, go for the big idea, and, and don't be afraid of failure because uh, the, probably the, the less nice way of putting it is the stakes aren't that high. But it, you, can, you can go out on a limb, and if you fall, it'll be okay. Your, your career's not gonna be ruined, nothing's gonna be ruined. Uh, in fact, your professors will respect you more because you try, and they're gonna invest more in you because you're out there on that limb, and they're gonna be the ones to catch you. And, and not just your professors, administration here, uh, it's really a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Um, but the fact that there is a city out here that's welcome to that, that, that really strives to have Mercer students be involved and, and engage it, and that's where you're gonna find your vocation because the, the amount of, of education you can get won't lead you to the, the second part of what vocation is, the intersection with a need in the world. And as a representative of the city of Macon, we do have those needs. Um, so, so come on, stay here, engage with it. Um, because that's the only way that the, the education can truly be reciprocal, uh, not just dyadic. Um, and, and the other thing uh, about the Mercer that I didn't do, I didn't do enough of was Go full tilt on on the offerings here. Like, I didn't study abroad. I, I you know, didn't do take some of the classes I would have wanted to take. I didn't go to as many seminars as I probably should have. I didn't go to as many lectures as I could have. They're offered for a reason. Because there's value in them that you'll gain. I don't know why I didn't know that then. That was weird. <laughs> like, I was paying to come here. I'm like, ah, you know, nothing. Um, so, so don't let that opportunity pass you by, whether, whether it's academic, whether it's athletic, whether it's intramural sport, whether, whether it's the opportunity to do a service learning project. If any of you don't take a class because it has a service learning component, I'm going to be upset with you. Uh, I'm not the only one in the room, but, but hey, that's, that's where I got the most value out of my education. So just take those opportunities and dive in and, and, and I can probably teed up Austin with that because uh, he, he's my intern, so I know he's done that. <laughs> uh, sort of bringing this into a, a, a current student context, uh, kind of talking to you more as a peer uh, who doesn't quite have uh, as much experience as some of the alums on this panel. Uh, I, I think the, the biggest importance of liberal arts education is as um, sort of, as we're going to start entering the job market, uh, in, in the coming years, there's going to be less and less of these uh, sort of just perfect, uh, perfectly made jobs where you can just stay there for 40 years and, and retire. So I think, I think more and more it's going to be on our generation to be flexible and, and to have a skill set and, 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 a, uh, and a trait almost to, um, to, to really bring to the city. So I, I like to call myself an apprentice of Alex, not an intern. Because it's really more of a craft we're trying to build here. Uh, it, uh, something that, that we can really bring in regardless of our community and regardless of our surrounding and make a difference. And, and I think that's, that's the best thing. I think the, the, the other three parents here really told you the how um, to do that, uh, to definitely go out and fail uh, and, and get engaged and get involved. And uh, also, Mercer, Mercer students, I think a lot of times, we, um, because this, this kind of take risk ethos sort of exists, a lot of times we brought up more than we achieve. So I, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll go to an analogy I heard while I was in South Africa by both my professor in the room of the hummingbird. The hummingbird in the water, there's, there's a fire in the forest all around, and the hummingbird is running water out to try to put out the fire. Um, and all the animals are running and ask what the hummingbird's doing. He says, I'm doing my part, what are you guys doing? So I, I think it's much that's all we can really do uh, in sort of a, a, a deep way to end that. So I'll drop the mic on that <laughs> Sorry. I have so many thoughts, <laughs> and everybody, this is just awesome. Yeah, you know, Alita was also my orientation leader um, the very first day that I was, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, a couple more 
tips, I, I feel like I want to debunk some of the myths that I think are told to millennials about um, about jobs and about your worth. Um, so just really quick, a couple other things that I'm thinking about. Um, it's a lie that you need to move around and do a bunch of different things after you graduate, that you need to move year each year uh, and do something new. You can, um, but mentioning staying in Mercer uh, or staying in Macon after graduation is, is an incredible suggestion. Um, if you don't stay in Macon, if you go to another place, try staying there for two years, for three years. Um, if you are not miserable, if you feel like, yeah, I could do this for another year, do it. Because every year that you're another, uh, every bit of time you spend in an organization or a business or um, whatever you choose, uh, that job is going to be become more crafted to you, um, and you're going to learn more about the real issues that are affecting people. Um, if you keep bopping around, you're never going to understand some of the underlying, the real issues. Um, and I think that there's also uh, a loneliness that comes from moving around so much um, and insisting on going to grad school right after college. Um, Maybe I'm biased because I, I haven't done it yet, and my professors are like, hey, you should go back to grad school. Um, but your, your life, you are not a human doing, you are a human being. Your life includes uh, friends, and uh, if you worship a congregation or a temple or a mosque, it includes um, the people that so lean on you and that you lean on, uh, people you sing with, people you, you play baseball with. Um, your vocation is, is a lot of things. And if you can find some pieces of that, sometimes that's worth staying for. Sometimes your job isn't even the thing worth staying for. Um, and your worth is, is bigger than, than that job you might have right then. Um, yeah. I want to thank all of you. We're incredibly fortunate to have such articulate, passionate, and gifted panelists. Um, at this point, we'd like to open it up to our audience. If you have any questions, uh, comments, things that were not addressed, things you're just curious about. and 
economically uh, and, and almost literally on some type of transportation network in a park in, in a public space in some way. And how we address that is very important. So if there's one field that I could say uh, that I deal with a lot that really needs more liberal arts majors is that of engineering. Uh, that, that particularly traffic engineers, <laughs> uh, they, they really like building really wide roads for people to drive in fast cars, where I'm, you know, riding my bike going, hey, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I would like some room here. <laughs> or the, 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 you know, building a sidewalk that's wide enough for people to walk on. Um, so places, thing, things like that, that you may not be taught in a, uh, a, to derogatorily put it, a widget factory type education, um, where you, you know, we're talking about people who, who generate a certain type of product. Um, because at a place like Mercer, at a liberal arts institution, the, the type of product that you're having is the best people we can be, the, the best citizens we can be, the best that we can engage. And I mean, that's definitely something that I, as, as I'm looking at applications and seeing people who are, who are coming up in the organization, that's what I'm going to see. And that's what I always try to tell students that I interact with is, like, that's got to be your perspective. It's how do you engage the world? How, how does what you do make the place that you're in better? Uh, that's the driving question, less so than what's best for me um, individually. So uh, I, yeah, I do harken back to that a lot. And, and just to add one, one aside, uh, I, I still talk about Aristotle in my government position and, and tell them about you know, certain the degrees of metaphysics in, in different uh, states. And uh, it, it, sometimes it works people out. Uh, but but it, it really is telling how, how important that is and how um, an understanding of the world at a, at a deeper level and taking that, that, that examination that much further is something that I think society as a whole needs more of. And as we try to grow forward as a nationwide or worldwide community as we are, that the liberal arts education that we get in places like this helps us understand other people. I mean, that's what it's for. And if we, if we don't have that, if we lose that as a society, we will continue to lose ourselves. just wanted to also add the two big things that I see as, I, as an aging millennial, y'all learned that's what I am today, I read an article, that I'm on the top end of, we're all millennials, but I'm an aging millennial, and Austin is a middle millennial, and so, or you're kind of a young millennial, so anyway. <laughs> but uh, one of the things Laura mentioned earlier, as far as uh, a misconception, I think, is that we are uh, super narcissistic. I would argue that everyone is narcissistic, um, that we're addicted to our phones, just like our parents were addicted to the TV at one point, and then our grandparents were the radio. And I'm a history teacher, so there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, the media is just captivating. Um, but two big things uh, that go along with what I think millennials are doing better with, and that uh, I think are helpful with liberal arts are creativity and social justice. And so creativity is something no matter what your major uh, is really important and whether you're an engineer or a philosopher uh, is really, really important. And the example that Laura gave about Dr. Drake giving them that opportunity for differentiated instruction is something that's so beautiful. It's just like, Ooh. I mean, that's just big, uh, huge, and letting people um, get to their, um, letting people get to the goal for on their own avenue. So that's really, really cool. And by giving people agency and space to do that. And in social justice, uh, I try, I know in my classes to teach United States history through a social justice lens, which I absolutely learned from Mercer. So when we're talking um, about the early 19th century, we are not only talking about Andrew Jackson, we are also talking about all of the reform movements of the time, and talking about people on the margins who were absolutely trying to um, effect, effect change. Uh, even though the odds were stacked against them, um, whether you're talking about the Hummingbird uh, metaphor or uh, anything else, it's important. So um, I think those two things are positive things that I'm seeing with people, even if I'm a high school teacher, so even if they haven't yet gotten to liberal arts, I'm hoping I'm not so uh, secretly pushing them that way uh, with my high school juniors and seniors, but also um, on the back end when they've been through liberal arts. And I think that's when you look at some of the tech startups, you're, you're seeing things, which is exciting. Yeah, I, 
I meet like hundreds of volunteers and interns that come through our agency every year and have a sense of, of who does better than others. And um, I really love it when we get a humanities student or, or some other liberal arts student. And a lot of them are because they're just naturally drawn to humanitarian kind of work. Um, but it's so funny because we'll have like check-in meetings about how they're doing and their internships and they're all asking, they're all sitting like this going, what does it mean that so-and-so had to go home right after we went to social security office and I got to go to my nice dorm room and they went home to, you know, to their crappy one bedroom apartment with their five siblings. And what does it mean that, and I love that, what does it mean that? What does it mean that? That's like, that's how you know that they're a liberal arts student. Um, and the thing is they had peers and, and brilliant, caring professors to go back to during their classes and talk about these experiences that they were having and trying to make sense of, you know, I was, this is where I'm situated, this is where everyone else is situated, what do I do, what can I do? Um, or just how do I walk alongside somebody in a different situation than me? And I think the, the tough part, if you want to do, especially if you want to work with vulnerable populations, is that you've got to, you've got to be able to sustain your energy and your enthusiasm for it. You're going to burn out if you don't have a big tank of like, <coughs> love and, and excitement and, and these values. And I, I feel like that's what that's what humanity students have that um, even sometimes like the bachelors of social work students don't have. Um, or, or the biology majors that are just kind of like, oh, I want to do an internship with, with you guys. Um, yeah, and the, yeah. If I can add anything, um, maybe brief. Um, it would be, be a lot of times I suggest my peer group and naturally it's myself. Uh, the best thing I think a liberal arts education does is it allows you to um, kind of mesh the, a lot of times it's called the right brain and the left brain. So if you're sort of more the idealistic, uh, philosophy, history, political science, um, and or foreign language, and, and really sort of trying to test more of that detail-oriented uh, biology, biochemistry. I, I think one of the best things in liberal arts education lets you do is uh, really sort of bring together interdisciplinary as well. They sort of bring together um, the different sides. I think those would be the most dangerous people, I guess, in, in the uh, good kind of danger. And, and the, the job market moving forward is is the people who both kind of see the big picture and see how people work together go back to Knox examples, traffic engineers who know how people work, who know how things work together. I mean, I think that's what um, our, our generation could really use more of is, is uh, in Mercer, I think, kind of change the JAD curriculum from our class and IT program to sort of bring that together. And I think we need to take advantage of that and, and really sort of uh, use that to our advantage as we get a career ready and uh, make an impact on the world. I love that you all are at, you know, out of the tunnel or seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and I've taken two pages of notes, so that's a nice role reversal, isn't it? Um, but, you know, I think a lot of times we deal with parents of high school students who don't understand why their students need unscripted learning and have actually, I've had to actually answer the question, this class is called Understanding Self and Others. What, is that a real class? And, you know, what, what would you say that we can say to those parents about why this kind of unscripted learning is important? Well, the two words, let go. Um, <laughs> I wish, even when, there's, even when they're juniors and seniors, I want to tell them that sometimes. Uh, and I teach a humanities course, get a humanities course, uh, which is English history. Um, what, there's one English teacher, one history teacher. We're trying to maybe help push them out of the nest a little bit um, from that, and we don't have a text. We do we have several smaller texts, and you know, help make them be, make them do a lot of reflective writing and things like that. It's painful and it's hard, and um, a lot of times parents, uh, high school or, or university level, probably want to make sure they're getting a good return on investment, and that to them that means money, that means dollars, that means they're going to take care of me one day, you know. And of course they will uh, in all ways, financially and emotionally, and I would say emotionally, this is the part that liberal arts especially helps with, and, and the money will come to, it will be fine, you know. Um, but I think helping, I think maybe to say to them, you know, we are so excited that your student is here, and this is a time that we hope that there's a lot of independent learning and individual reflection not only separate from their high school, but separate from you, because they're an individual. Now, the parents probably want to hear that. That's hard, you know. Um, but 
sometimes they, I think if you frame them in a nice way, if we're trying to help them be a real person, a real boy, a real girl, you know, uh, a young woman or young man, um, that's hard to hear, but um, it also hope might be comforting to hear that we care about them too. And uh, it's now our, we are now working to help them become meaningful members of the community which is something I know I haven't mentioned yet, but that's something that I know has affected all of us at Marshall, not only academically, but also what does it mean to be a community member, uh, which I love that IMT is doing, uh, listening to the, um, tonight. So I don't know if that helps, um, but you know, let go and help, help your child be a person, and that's hard, but be proud of what they do because they're going to do great things, if you will. Well, on that resounding note, um, I think we should go ahead and end so that we can enjoy the last of the fruit. But I do want to um, say, as a faculty member, I feel incredibly affirmed being here today. Um, it's really, it truly inspirational to hear your stories and to, hear, to see your lives as models of being engaged in what means to be truly human. So it makes, makes it worthwhile. So thank you very much uh, for sharing your stories with us today. I'm sure.